Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. We're a couple of minutes past time. So I think everybody pretty much knows me, but if not, it's on the screen. Uh, I'm David Scarborough. Been here not as long as Dr. Levine, but almost. Uh, and uh, so uh, talking about fasting and the health span. Uh, health span meaning the length of life where the quality of life is still what you as the person would regard as good uh, and worthwhile. So disclosures and uh, cautions. I have no commercial anything to disclose. Uh, however, I do have to highlight that uh, fasting and ketogenic diets and similar things are certainly incompletely characterized from a medical standpoint uh, and therefore uh, are also not characterized as a primary treatment for common medical conditions. And all of those words were chose, chosen carefully, I'll tell you. But in any case, what, what this talk is intended to do is to update uh, ongoing work in this area and should never be construed to be giving individual medical advice, by which I mean I don't want anybody to start their own fasting program uh, uh, as a result of this without having uh, uh, done it with the proper advice, whatever that might be. Uh, okay. So what we are going to sort of highlight today is a little bit about the current status of obesity treatments, I'm going to talk about some of the terminology that's in this area, uh, what's fasting, what's time-restricted feeding, what's starvation, uh, fasting and ketogenic diets. Uh, a little review for everybody about the physiology of fasting and hypoglycemia. Uh, and then we will talk about how these things relate to the common medical conditions like, for example, obesity, diabetes, cancer, and probably a general concern with longevity. Not going to talk much at all about bariatric procedures or drug treatments for obesity. Also not going to talk much about plant-based or vegetarian diets. Although, as I say, these are important, just not emphasized today. And then the role of the microbiome, that's another one that's important, and we're not going to do much about it. But you can think about things happening to the biome as the unmeasured variable in virtually everything I show today, because uh, they all have to do with diet and energy balance and what have you. So. Why talk about fasting? Well, primarily because we have this uh, massive uh, epidemic, tsunami, whatever you want to call it, of obesity in the United States. Here's self-reported obesity greater than one-third of the population. And of course, we're right here. Uh, and then there's everything that goes with that over time. So it's, uh, it's a actually a public health crisis, uh, uh, if not in the immediate present, although it is already actually, but going forward it's probably going to get worse rather than better as the morbidities that go along with uh, obesity, which are listed uh, here, uh, work their uh, ill on the body and psyche of the uh, persons uh, afflicted. And I mean, I keep adding things to this slide as evidence accumulates. Thyroid cancer was a re relatively recent addition, but seems to be true. And then there's a bunch of stuff down at the bottom that you could keep going about. So uh, the obesity is a big problem, and all this goes with it. and. What we have now is not quite up to the task, which is sort of going to be the next topic here. So here's uh, the MMWR uh, from when last uh, October, uh, going over the statistics for K 
cancers that have been associated with obesity. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and uh, so the, their estimate was that there were about 631,000 persons who were receiving a diagnosis of an obesity-associated cancer, which was about 40% of all the cancers diagnosed. So one of the many things uh, related to this, we think. Okay, so what are the treatment options to deal uh, with obesity? So we have drugs and we have medications. Uh, so these can be illicit and these can be prescribed, if you like. All the various bariatric procedures, and these are getting better, and they're getting uh, uh, not cheap exactly, but at least in some cases cheaper, but they're all still pretty uh, expensive. We have diet and lifestyle, and then I put in gene editing just as a little joke, uh, although you can imagine that not being a joke, in the not too distant future. So who knows? So here is uh, the uh, most recent general guideline. And this is uh, a guideline signed on to by all the major medical uh, associations and colleges and what have you. Uh, and the people that put together the report are sort of a who's who of the experts in the area of obesity. Uh, we have folks from the NIH here, we have Pennsylvania here, we have Boston here, we have Baton Rouge here, and on it goes. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is the latest received wisdom. And here they're talking about weight loss maintenance, and they say that the usual pattern in people undergoing a lifestyle intervention is that they get their maximum weight loss at six months, followed by a plateau and gradual gain. And then they go on to point out that this is also true for medication-assisted weight loss, although that may slow things down. And for bariatric surgery, it may take much longer for the weight to plateau. Okay, fine. Now, what are they suggesting doing about this? Well, they suggest that you be flexible and willing to try different approaches, okay, uh, and that patients should be advised that participation in a long term, as in greater than a year, comprehensive weight loss program with monthly or more frequent contact because that could improve weight maintenance. They suggested that you do self-weighing uh, and do high-level physical activity greater than 200 minutes per week. Okay. We're all ready for that, I think. Ha ha. Okay. So here is uh, the sustainability problem. This is a longtime researcher. He was on that list that I just showed way back in 1993 doing a study with an 800 calorie per day diet a lot of behavior modification, which was his specialty, or putting the two together. And they were able to get about an 18 kilogram weight loss, which is really pretty good uh, for a diet and exercise kind of program. And then this shows what happens uh, a after the intervention. And the answer is, well, you don't get much of a plateau before the regain starts. Uh, and then they end up heavier after five years. So that's, you know, one, one study, but it's uh, fairly typical, although this is better than a lot, uh, and so on. So here we go. And then here's the diabetes prevention program, which had a three to four year intervention and a five to seven year follow up. And this comparison was between a placebo for metformin, metformin, and a lifestyle intervention. And here we are, we got the x-axis axis in years, and sure enough, the maximum weight loss was at that six to 12 month interval, and then we have our regain, which happened in this case over a period of, well, one, two, three, four, five, so it's right on schedule. Uh, and we end up, years down the road, 
at the same place as the placebo group, although maybe a little better than where we started. So not entirely uh, fruitless, you would have to say. And this is the, uh, this is weight. This is cumulative incidence of diabetes. And here again, the lifestyle actually did a little better than the drug. Uh, and here's the uh, placebo group. And as you can see, there's still a lot of obesity, uh, diabetes happening uh, out there at 10 years. All right, so here's Oprah. Oprah, when she is carrying more weight, and this was where she had a successful weight loss intervention, uh, and she's on her show uh, showing how much fat she lost in a great big plastic bag here. Uh, and uh, so, you know, you can lose weight, and she did. I just put in here that her net worth, this is about a year ago, was $3.4 billion. Uh, so you would have to say that she apparently has been able, even though she couldn't, you know, control her weight that well, she was able to uh, be a winner in American society, you'd have to say. Uh, and this is a more recent picture showing that she, too, has issues with sustainability. Uh, and so she's partnered with Weight Watchers, the all-new Weight Watchers, in which she says Weight Watchers freestyle is not a diet. It's a way of living. Okay? In other words, it needs to be flexible and long-term, as the guidelines suggested. Uh, okay? And I showed this last January when I did Grand Rounds. It's a meta-analysis uh, from about, what, 10 years ago uh, of weight loss clinical trials that had at least one year of follow-up. So what do we have? Here we have very low energy diets. Here's six months. Here's four years. And you can see we're kind of on track to get our regain. Uh, and this is a you know, combined studies here. Up here is advice alone. So this is what happens if you see them in the clinic and you say, you know, your weight is bad, it's too high, it's hurting you, you really should try to get in more exercise, you should really try to cut back on your portion size, whatever your standard little talk might be, and the efficacy of this uh, is generally, well, approaches nil. And, of course, this is why after a while you quit doing it. <laughs> if you're uh, many physicians, including me at one point, pretty much. Okay, here's meal replacements, uh, which are sh shakes and bars, we call those. Here's diet plus exercise. So, over time, at least a year follow-up. So, at least there's a little something compared to the... Uh, advice alone group, uh, which didn't lose any weight. On the other hand, if you look at the total amount of weight lost, it's not a whole lot. And of course, half will be higher and half will be lower and so on. Okay, now here's the impact of a continued intervention on weight. Five-year results from the weight loss maintenance trial. Uh, and this included Hopkins, Duke, Baton Rouge, Kaiser Permanente, and they had a uh, intervention, and at uh, six months, uh, that turns out to be as low as it was. And then they had a couple of continued interventions. Uh, so PC was the personal contact, and SD was self-directed. So people left to themselves, given what they'd been taught, uh, and then these were people getting continued personal attention. Uh, and as you can see, there's not a lot of difference here. And the difference is nine pounds kept off versus seven pounds kept off. So this is something less than overwhelming, although, you know, of some value. All right. Now, the uh, NIH had a working group a few years ago, 2015, where they got together and they were trying to think of how to improve the maintenance of weight loss. Because as you can see, it's kind of poor. Uh, 
And again, this is a who's who of folks, some of the same ones, like Dr. Ryan from Pennington. Uh, and uh, they uh, basically ended up uh, deciding that more research was needed. They didn't really have an answer. Uh, and there are lots of things known about why you might plateau, why you might regain, and I've listed a few of them here. Uh, and uh, the biome's not on the list, but maybe that's part of it, who knows. Uh, and, but you know, the difficulty is we have an unsolved problem here. We can get weight off of people for a while, but we have a real hard time getting it to stay off, and that's uh, a problem. So here's uh, something that came out, uh, what, a year ago, and this is from uh, Pennington. Uh, summarizing 50 years of behavioral lifestyle interventions. And the, the summary was that, yes, indeed, we can, we can get weight off, uh, and this achieves favorable effects on things such as diabetes development. And so the various funding agencies have begun to fund weight loss lifestyle stuff, uh, which they didn't do much of that before, uh, past a certain point. Uh, and uh, the trouble is these all, that the, all of them that they're funding are fundamentally using the let's eat less and move more strategy. And the move more can be at what I showed you earlier. Uh, the eating less can be portion restriction. Uh, but it's, uh, that's the basic uh, plan. A uh, lot of individual and group counseling. And we just saw from that prior slide what that gets you. You know, nine versus seven pounds. Uh, so, you know, where to go with this? I mean, maybe we could consider something a little more severe like fasting. So, uh, here's uh, the seven deadly sins. So, if you don't move much, that's slothfulness. So uh, you're being encouraged to be less slothful. Uh, and if you eat too much, that's gluttony. And if you cut that back, that's eating less. Uh, now, there are some other seven deadly sins here, including the ones that come up in the medical profession. You might recognize these. Pride, greed. These are sort of ours. Okay. All right, so what, what to say about fasting? First, uh, fasting means different things to different people, and we'll talk more about some of these. Uh, I love it when I talk to somebody and I, I mention fasting, and they tell me, oh, well, I already do that. I say, okay, tell me about that. And they say, well, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I only eat uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I said, well, do you eat anything in between? Uh, they say, no, I'm fasting. Well, I do have snacks. So actually, they're not fasting at all uh, unless in the middle of the night they don't get up and go to the fridge. And of course, some do. But uh, so you can have a very uh, relaxed notion about what fasting is. So for some people, if you don't sit down to a full meal, well, then you're fasting. So, uh, and that's not what we generally mean by it in the context of weight loss programs. All right, so what is time-restricted feeding? This is where you limit the window of eating to less than the usual overnight fast, okay? So uh, if you don't get up in the middle of the night to eat, then you're pretty much fasting between the last snack and the first uh, meal or snack of the day. Now depending on how long you sleep and so forth, you know, this could be a, a four-hour fast overnight. <laughs> uh, it could be uh, a 12-hour fast. It could be a lot of things. And what's usually meant in the medical literature is something that's probably going to be longer than, say, uh, six or seven hours. And, you know, it can be any, any, any length after that. Alternate day fasting is where you have actual fasting 
And here I mean you're not eating anything with significant caloric value. Water, yes, you know, coffee maybe, but almost nothing. Uh, sometimes it's used to mean a very low calorie intake. For example, there's alternate day fasting, and on the fasting day, you can have, oh, 400 or 500 calories in some studies. So, now what's intermittent fasting? That's where you're doing actual fasting or a very low calorie intake for periods that last generally a day or longer. So alternate day would be a variant of intermittent fasting. Uh, and actually, if you want to think about it, I mean, your regular routine might be intermittent fasting because, well, you're fasting while you're asleep and then you're not fasting when you're up. So, but generally is meant to be a little longer. And usually it means less than 14 days in a row, uh, although that's a fairly flexible thing. Now, there is some similarity, and we'll come back to this later, between what happens with fasting and what happens with a low-carb intake in the sense that both of these situations are going to lead to a ketosis by and by and are therefore ketogenic. They will also tend to lead to low insulin levels, and that's a similarity, although that depends on whether you're on exogenous uh, uh, insulin. And then we have starvation. Now, you may have noticed that a lot of our patients and our patients' families seem to think that missing a meal or two is starvation. Because, you know, you can have somebody who's NPO for a day and a half because they may be going to surgery and we're not sure when. Uh, uh, and the family will come in and give you a hard time. Why haven't you fed them? They've missed two meals. This is bad. <laughs> you know, so for some folks, starvation means you miss any eating for any period of time. Now what I mean by it and what many people be by, mean by it is where you have been deprived of uh, sustenance to the point that you are developing a pathology of some kind. And that, that can happen relatively quickly if you're very fragile and depleted to start with. Uh, and it may take quite a long time if you're not. Uh, and it also depends on you know, other factors, such as whether you have the ability to, to adapt uh, to the lack of calories and the lack of uh, intake. And we'll come back to that. Okay. So a little bit about the religious faces of fasting. And I'm going to keep coming back to, you know, good things about fasting maybe, bad things about fasting maybe. Uh, so with the religious faces, the take-home message is that fasting in various forms has been around for a very long time in human populations, often in the context of spiritual or religious uh, practices. So in Hinduism, for example, and here's Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he uh, uh, would fast, I think, partly for spiritual stuff, and he also used fasts as a political weapon fairly effectively, by and by. Uh, in Nepal, there are uh, some festivals uh, chiefly involving women called, I think, the Tej, and then something that they call Ekadashi. Uh, and these are associated with, uh, with religious uh, practice, but they are uh, often undertaken in the context of uh, either getting a good husband or having uh, a husband kept happy so that the family is good and happy. Uh, and then we have Islam where we have Ramadan and this is uh, uh, a month-long uh, fast and feast combination. Here's a little thing that was uh, here for the last, last Ramadan where they were pointing out the number of hours that you would be fasting depending upon where you were uh, in, the, uh, in the globe. And if you were in Iceland, you had a pretty narrow window to work with uh, since you were fasting for 21 hours. So, 
And then we have the Christian traditions, and these uh, may go back to the temptation of Christ, which apparently after uh, Jesus was baptized, uh, he went into the desert for a 40-day fast, which uh, then became the basis for the annual Lenten observances that are still with us in the Catholic tradition. So here we have the devil with some pretty devilish feet, and he's offering a little bread uh, to, uh, to Jesus. So, and this is, you know, pretty tempting, obviously. Uh, I don't know whether he's about to grab it or, or wave it away. So, and then here we have uh, the downside, perhaps, of fasting uh, or near fasting, which is uh, the Minnesota experiment, which was conducted in the 1940s by the physiologist Ansel Keys. And this is a picture of some of the subjects who were conscientious objectors uh, and were semi-drafted into the study instead of uh, uh, having to go to the uh, hostilities. And uh, they're resting in the sun of a Minnesota summer and you can see they've gotten awfully cachectic here. Now this was not a simple fast. In fact, they were, were eating some calories. They were just calorie restricted and it was not a very high quality diet. And furthermore, they were required to continue to do some physical work because this was meant to replicate prison camp uh, conditions and that was why the Department of Defense funded it. Uh, so. They didn't do too well. They felt badly. They uh, were thinking of food all the time. This was a pretty hard thing for them. Uh, this is their basal metabolism over the six-month period, uh, during which they dropped uh, their basal metabolic rate per kilogram of weight uh, per body surface area, and then per person. So they had a 40% drop uh, per person from where they started. And what's happening? They're plateauing at six months. I think there's physiology here, don't you? This is not about, I don't know, psychology. <laughs> this is about physiology. OK. So this is George Cahill. Uh, who was a uh, MD and a professor of medicine at Harvard. Uh, and he did very important work on starvation or fasting, if you like. Uh, and this is from his presidential address to the American Clinical and Climatological Association. I don't think they were climatological because of the global warming thing. This was earlier than that. Uh, they were a sciency organization. But in any event, uh, here, here were the phases of starvation. And he says, the transition from the fed to the fasted state in man is a sequence of alterations that occurs to provide calories for survival and are listed below with the approximate duration. So you're still absorbing substrate from your meals for about eight hours. You then begin to break down glycogen and liver and muscle, and that'll last a couple of days. Gluconeogenesis, the formation of glucose from precursor in the liver, is going on uh, as a prominent thing during the first week. You start to get some ketosis within three to four days. So not so much the first couple of days, more three to four days. Uh, and then over time, you get diminishing gluconeogenesis and an increase in cerebral ketone consumption. And this is the second week and onward. So this is, you know, basic physiology of uh, what's going on with energy, basic energy stuff, uh, when you fast or starve. So here's a uh, paper that... Uh, was in the Annual Review of Nutrition by Dr. Cahill, and he's broken it up here into five phases of glucose homeostasis. So this is glucose used grams per hour, 
so 40 grams per hour, and then it's uh, exogenous glucose, basically, that you ate. And so over four hours, you're basically consuming that. And what's going on? All your tissues are using glucose because it's a preferred energy substrate. The brain is using the glucose. Now, when you get past this point, you're beginning to burn glycogen. And glycogen is in the, the muscle and the liver. Uh, and so you're also beginning to do your gluconeogenesis in the liver. So that's here. Uh, and so tissues using glucose, everybody except uh, the liver. The muscle and the adipose tissue are still using it, but they're cutting back a bit. And the brain is still on sugar. And then as you go past the length of time that would be associated with a good night's sleep, you begin to get uh, more into gluconeogenesis, and you're still using your glycogen. And so we're in this period where we're going to be crossing. Uh, and then you uh, begin to see these changes where uh, muscle and adipose tissue are intermediate rates. Brain's still mainly glucose. And then we get out, here's two days. Here's three days. So this would be a 72-hour fast right here where it's gluconeogenesis and you're out of glycogen. So where is the blood glucose coming from? It's coming uh, from gluconeogenesis, which is principally hepatic and renal. Uh, tissues using glucose. The brain is using glucose. Red cells, the renal medulla. Uh, and a little bit of a general muscle. What's fueling the brain? Glucose and ketones. And then by the time you get past three weeks or thereabouts, then you begin to get into, well, you're still using gluconeogenesis. The brain, however, is not using it so much. It's using some, but it's using lots of ketones. Your red cells, your renal medulla still need their sugar. Now, here's a, a paper that came out in 1996, and I put it in just to remind people that gluconeogenesis can involve glycerol coming from the breakdown of uh, fatty, uh, fats, and you end up with a three-carbon moiety that can be put together into glucose. Uh, you can also get the three carbons from protein. Uh, and... Uh, but if, you're, if your glucose is only coming from protein uh, and uh, um, the uh, fat breakdown, then you may be using too much protein. And we'll come back to that. So here we've got uh, what happens where we make this shift. So we're, in, we're burning fat. So the fat's being broken down. And the glycerol uh, can go to some gluconeogenesis as needed. The fatty acids can be oxidized into the ketones. And these are in the liver. And it gets back into the blood. And it can go places like the brain, where the brain can be fueled uh, by the ketones. So here's Dr. Cahill's uh, early actual paper on this. 1967 was the year I graduated high school. So, uh, and the Joslin Laboratories, named after Elliot Joslin, who kept type 1 diabetics alive by significantly starving them in order to keep the sugars low. Uh, anyway, Dr. Cahill and colleagues say, the use of prolonged starvation for the treatment of obesity has posed a fascinating problem, namely that man is capable of fasting for periods of time beyond which he would have utilized all his carbohydrate resources and all of his protein for gluconeogenesis in order to provide adequate calories as glucose for the brain. And earlier uh, in the uh, paper, he goes over that calculation. And at the time, people were thinking that that's what you did when you starved. You just used protein uh, and glycogen. 
So he says, this study, did I lose my, yeah. okay. This study was designed to clarify the apparent paradox, and it was found that beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate replace glucose as the brain's primary fuel. And so there were three people that were in this study. Is the mic working? No, it's not. Why not? Oh. Well, it may be the battery. We'll see. I hope not. Okay. So we had uh, three obese people. They weighed uh, around 100, 100 plus kgs. Uh, they were of these ages and sexes. And they had some physical problems related to their overweight. And they signed up and were starved for, uh, well, let's see, how long was it? Well, it was 40 days. Remember 40 days? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then they had sampling on the arterial side and the venous side of uh, blood from the neck. Uh, ooh, okay. Lost it again. It's the battery. So, let's see. Anybody remember how to get this open? No. Is it this? No, it's not that. Well, I don't remember how to get this thing open. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> okay, going to have to speak up. Uh, so let's uh, imagine getting this past the IRB, I guess is what I was going to say. But uh, so uh, he's making the point at the end that they were able to show that, in fact, the ketone bodies were providing most of the uh, energy to the brain at the end of this uh, long fast. They did other things. They did psychometric testing and EEGs and so forth to show that they were still functioning fine as people despite the 40-day fast. Okay. So, now I'm going to just uh, briefly here remind you about how we uh, work up hypoglycemia in medicine. Uh, we like to use Whipple's triad, uh, where you have symptoms that suggest hypoglycemia, and you have a low plasma glucose measured at the same time in a reliable way, and that when we give you sugar, you relieve the symptoms uh, as the glucose level comes up. Uh, I'm going to actually skip this part, but it is key that the uh, glucose be low in a reliable method at the same time that you proceed to do uh, your testing. So we often use a 72-hour fast, and remember where that falls on Cahill's uh, scheme, and we're trying to provoke the homeostatic responses that normally keep the blood glucose up. Uh, and this is in up-to-date, and they point out that normal people 
uh, do not have symptomatic hypoglycemia after a prolonged fast because you have methods that keep your glucose up or you get lipolysis and ketones to supply the brain. Uh, the prolonged fast results in hypoglycemia only if you have a defect in this system somewhere. For example, you might have an excess of insulin, which inhibits endogenous glucose production, i.e. gluconeogenesis, and it also prevents you from transitioning to ketone dependence for the brain. So that's one of those. So here's the Endocrine Society guideline on this, and they show you what to expect after or during a 72-hour fast whenever the uh, hypoglycemia happens. And I put here that normal people don't get symptoms or signs even though their glucose may be less than 55. And that's if, of course, their ketones have gone high enough to supply their brain adequately. Uh, and there are a few other things here. But there are subtleties uh, that can be borne in mind. For example, you do adapt to low glucoses uh, if you experience them repeatedly. And we run into this in diabetics who uh, have repeated lows. They stop defending their lows as well. Uh, and so they have a tendency to get lower, and that's a problem in management. Uh, if we try to do an insulin tolerance test to test the stress axis, uh, we may uh, get someone that has a seizure because they have a low, uh, they have an area where there's a seizure focus that is not ordinarily expressed, but when you make it uh, hypoglycemic, it becomes uh, a seizure focus and there's an actual seizure. You also get sympathetic responses, so if there's a cult coronary disease, you may give them a heart attack. So you do have to be very careful with hypoglycemia, and it depends in part on the context. Now, we've had ma malignant insulinoma patients who had plenty of insulin around, and that would have been presumably suppressing their ketones, and yet they, may, they would not get symptomatic or feel bad until their sugars were as low as 20. Now, Cahill did an experiment where he had healthy volunteers adapted to uh, starvation and gave them insulin and drove the uh, glucoses very low, and they were asymptomatic, but they were asymptomatic because their brain was using their ketones. And lucky for him, they didn't have occult seizure fo foci, maybe, and so forth. Uh, so there are, the context matters quite a bit, whether or not you're going to be prone to hypoglycemia and whether you're going to be symptomatic from it, uh, depending on context. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've got enough time to go through this one. This was uh, four uh, healthy volunteers. They were lean people, uh, men and women. Uh, the, uh, and they were starved for four days. And this just shows you what goes on. Uh, their catecholamines go up, uh, as in uh, the Cahill experiment. Their insulins go down, uh, and uh, their glucose goes from 88 to 63 over four days. So they don't get particularly hypoglycemic. Uh, and certain other things. For example, their beta-hydroxybutyrate goes up this is micromoles, so if you make it uh, our conventional units, it goes up from about 0.2 uh, up to, say, 5 or 7 over four days. And so this is you know, obviously helpful uh, for the brain, which is beginning to depend on it. Okay, and this is uh, sort of the same data. Uh, they get a diuresis. Uh, their resting energy expenditure actually goes up because of the catecholamines uh, and their utilization of oxygen is going up. So, and this is a point that, that is often lost. 
in, in fasting, once you adapt to the ketones, you're still in this state where actually you're jazzed up. It's not like you're listless, you're not. You're energized. And this is uh, uh, important in the world where folks are trying to use longer fasts therapeutically. Okay, here's a comparison of a carbohydrate-free diet versus fasting uh, on glucose, uh, insulin, and the glucagon, although I'm not going to show you that data. Now, these were people who were older, who had had diabetes for periods of years, but were still able to be treated with milder treatments like metformin or sulfonylurea. Here's somebody with nothing. They had various diseases. They were all a little on the heavy side, at least overweight or maybe obese, and they were on a lot of different meds. Uh, what they did with these folks uh, is they uh, took them off their diabetes meds for at least uh, 24 uh, days, and then they gave them these experimental diets. So. Here's their glucose responses to, to meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So they have prandial excursions up into a not very good range if they're in the standard diet group. And this is the standard diet. 55% carbs, 15% protein, 30% fat. This is in the ballpark of what's usually recommended for people. Uh, and so if we look at the carbohydrate-free diet, which was really pretty much carbohydrate-free, the sugars were lower, okay? And if we used fasting, the sugars got down to like 120 to a little bit lower than that. So, th and these are, you know, chronic diabetics. Their sugars will come down if you fast them. Now here's the insulin responses. Uh, in microunits per liter. So these are the, now remember, these are earlier diabetics, so these are still folks with some insulin reserve, and they're making quite a lot of insulin with their meals. Uh, and if we use the carb free diet, you attenuate that quite a bit. Now, of course, you're still eating proteins, and those can have some stimulant effect. So we get a little bit, and then what makes it go as low as it can go? Well, fasting does. And so that's the difference there. Okay. And then this is just a paper pointing out that the typical American eating pattern uh, is one where uh, you're having multiple meals and multiple snacks. So you're getting glucose excursions most of the uh, time. This is two days here. Uh, if you do a one-day fast, then your glucose tends to be lower and then it bumps as you don't fast, the ketones begin to come up, and we've been over that a couple of times. And if we just do an 18-hour fast, which is a little longer than the typical, then we get, go from this to this, where it's much more confined, and you get a little bit of ketone bump each time. So, okay. Now this is... Uh, a company that uh, was founded by some low carbers, Dr. Finney and Volek, uh, and they do an online coaching with remote monitoring of your weight and your uh, sugars and other things. And uh, they're uh, getting rolling. It's Verta Health is the name of it. And they just done a study that they published uh, this past year. Uh, where they did this with a group of people at Purdue University that were part of the health plan there. Uh, and this is a ketogenic diet, so it's very low carb. It's not fasting. Uh, and this is the change in weight that they got uh, by percent uh, over a year. And they got, oh, whatever that is, like 13 uh, percent. And they call this a continuous care intervention. Uh, and this is the A1C at one year in the intervention group versus the usual care provided by the health plan. So what you see is that the 
A1Cs in the continuous care group move into the lower side of the identity, so they went down. Whereas the usual care people, hmm, they stayed about equally on the uh, identity line. Actually, they got a little worse. So this just shows that a ketogenic diet with, uh, done in this way without fasting will give you uh, some significant help with diabetes. And they're growing and signing up more people all the time. One of our fellows interviewed with them last year. Okay, and this is uh, the use of meds, and I'm gonna have to sort of zip along. Basically, the more blue that you have, the more you have gotten off meds that are relevant to diabetes. And this is the experimental group. So there's a lot of blue here. This is the usual care group, and there's very little blue here. Uh, and the brighter things is where they've had to start stuff. So the A1Cs have come down quite a bit, even though they're on way less meds. Uh, so this saves money and, uh, and what have you. Okay, here's another guy that I talk about fairly frequently. This is Dr. Bernstein. He's a type 1 diabetic himself, born in 1934, uh, and became a diabetologist. Uh, this is him. He's got pretty good triceps here. Uh, here he is two weeks ago doing his regular uh, podcast, as it were, uh, Teleseminar 37, November 2018. He's 84 years old, still working. He put himself on a low-carb diet for his type 1 diabetes when he was on the order of 30 years old. And he already had some uh, nephropathy and other issues and was basically able to stop the progression of his diabetic complications in his tracks. Uh, and it's a long story and it's a fun story, but the fact is he's done great even though he hardly ever eats any fruit at all. He is not vegetarian in any way, and he eats very low carb. And I'll just point out that his, his followers uh, on Facebook have a group, and the Harvard School of Public Health recently surveyed them and had them send in their medical records to see how they were doing with type 1 diabetes on a low-carb diet, okay? Not what you would find as standard of care. Uh, people are very worried about hypoglycemia and so forth. So obviously need to be careful. Uh, about half of the people in the study were doing fine with it and had not had anything horrible happen, happen to them However, they hadn't told their docs what they were doing. Imagine that. Okay. So, uh, and here's another uh, clinic uh, that uses uh, these types of things. This is Dr. Fung's uh, practice. He's a Toronto nephrologist who has been popularizing intermittent fasting and has used it quite a bit in his clinic. Uh, with a lot of diabetics. Now they have to watch them carefully because heaven knows you can get into trouble if you're on insulin uh, uh, and you start fasting, even intermittently. So this is one that they just published in uh, BMJ case reports. And they had three of them, they were older, that had diabetes forever, three guys. These were their medical problems. And the question was if they started them with a fasting program of some kind, how long would it take uh, to get them off uh, some of their meds? And this is what they were doing. They were doing intermittent fasts that were three times a week. And this is how, for the length of time. So here they are starting out, hemoglobin A1C of 11, 7.2, 6.8, uh, and how long to get them off insulin? Five days, 18 days, 13 days. And this is, you know, this is why you have to watch them because if you're not watching them, they'll bottom out 
because they get better so fast. Food for thought. I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to skip that one. Okay. I'm going to skip a bunch of stuff. So this notion of the lifespan, uh, it's been found that, that certain key checkpoints, as it were, in metabolism respond to energy intermediates. Uh, and if you manipulate those, you can improve things. For example, you can induce autophagy and mitophagy, which are kind of cellular renewal processes by intermittent fasting, among other things. So this is the schema that they're working with, where you have dietary restriction, you limit food consumption, or you do intermittent fasting, or you're selectively inhibiting amino acids. Of course, if you're fasting, you're inhibiting amino acids. Uh, and then you get all these things happening, which can go in to give you health. And these are a couple of articles that sort of sum up thoughts about this. Uh, and it is key that you avoid malnutrition uh, in order to get the good effects. Here's Dr. Longo. He's 51. And he's a gerontology PhD at UC, USC, uh, Leonard Davis Center. So, and he has a fasting mimicking diet that he's done in rodents uh, where you have small numbers of calories, but you're still uh, uh, eating other times. So it's a kind of combination of intermittent fasting and uh, variations. And they're able to get... Uh, uh, beta cells to regenerate in mice after they've been killed off by a toxin. And this is uh, just to say that some studies get different results. Uh, he's created a foundation, uh, has a best-selling book, and started a company to make a uh, proprietary version of his uh, formula for the fasting mimicking diet which they have tested in humans in a 71-person study where they managed to get the BMI down and the waist circumference down uh, and uh, visceral fat down and many other good things with this formula that's in the proprietary mix. Uh, so at least there's a little human evidence here that with this you can do a lot of things. He's got, uh, he's got data on in mice on tumors as well, and so on. So, but, you know, since this is a commercial enterprise, they have a, uh, a uh, warning that you can have severe problems and even death if you try to do this on your own and you're diabetic. So, and then here's Fasting the Movie, which you can see on Amazon Prime. And I checked myself today. It's on there. Uh, and it's an indie documentary about seven types of fasting showing both the good results that can happen and the catastrophes that can happen if people try to do it on their own without some medical supervision. Very interesting and I recommend it. And I totally am out of time. Sorry about the uh, microphone thing.